Uh, okay, we have our uh, our final panelist has joined, so I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Jess Atkins, is a professor of geochemistry and global environmental science at Caltech. Um, Jess is a chemical oceanographer who uses trace metals to study environmental processes, and he's been using his knowledge of ocean chemistry to investigate mechanisms for CO2 sequestration in seawater, and developing a process to sequester the emissions from the global shipping industry. Uh, so. Uh, Jess, welcome back from uh, Voyage at Sea, and uh, and thank you for joining us. So happy to be here, Neil. Thanks uh, for inviting me. I think, uh, like some of the other speakers, I'm going to share my screen here quickly, um, and uh, hopefully you guys can see uh, uh, some tums going into the ocean. Ah, good. So, yes, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit um, as just introduction, but but uh, really I mean this is seeding a bunch of questions from you guys um, about uh, a, a way forward on negative emissions that involves uh, storing CO2 as dissolved ions, specifically as bicarbonate. I will yield on the term on. And uh, this particular process is really, it's not just an analogy, it's the same sorts of reaction that when you take an antacid and uh, uh, when your stomach is feeling upset, uh, you're trying to neutralize the acid in your, in your stomach by adding uh, calcium carbonate um, uh, here in the US known as TOMS. Uh, so here they are bubbling in to neutralize seawater. And I think uh, a couple of the themes that I hope will come up here is a question of why have we been ignoring the ocean as a way to do negative emissions? Um, and uh, another one is that following the natural processes might be uh, a quite um, feasible and maybe even lucrative way. So I, I don't think I need to dwell on a, on a plot like this for too long uh, coming from the IPCC. Um, and uh, these kinds of spaghetti plots are uh, time 1980 up to 2100. Uh, in this case versus emissions and what we've actually done up to 2016 here is uh, this darker line and then the colored spaghetti is a bunch of model runs where you decide to put in emission scenarios. Th these are just the scenarios, all the, uh, all the lines and then the model results are over here on the right for how you come out uh, at, at a temperature in a suite of uh, IPCC class models. And the only way that we stay below the dangerous levels is by negative emissions. Uh, and those negative emissions need to start very soon. We can't just turn off our, our regular emissions. We're gonna have to go negative to stay, uh, to stay cool. Um, uh, we know how the planet will do sequestration. Um, uh, the, it will extract the CO2 by reacting it with calcium carbonate sediments at the bottom of the ocean. Um, this has been going on for uh, billions of years. It's one of the main ways the planet regulates the CO2. It's one of the reasons that it's not the only, but it's one of the reasons we're not Venus, that we haven't uh, lost a triple point of water and we've kept an equ equitable cli climate uh, through Earth history. Um, however, one problem with this, and this is just one uh, study. It's a little bit uh, hard to see, so I'll, I'll walk you through it. Um, from David Archer's work in the mid 90s, but as geochemists, we really understand this reaction at the global scale uh, fairly well. There we go. I'm back. Uh, <laughs> Neil clearly doesn't like this plot. Um, so <laughs> I, I put this up just to say, put in a variety of scenarios into a global model of the geochemical cycling of carbon. So what this model has is weathering on land, the carbon cycle in the ocean and the burial of carbonate uh, in, in sediments. Um, and you, these are the old ways of doing uh, of emission scenarios. They were called A's instead of RCPs. I'm sure they'll get a new name uh, as we go down the road. But this says do emissions up to, uh, oh my gosh, 2000 PPM CO2 and then stop or do it up to 1500 or 1000 or 500 and stop. And what happens in the, in the model of the natural cycle? You can see that CO2 always comes back down. And in fact, it comes back down to almost pre-industrial level, levels, but this axis is tens of thousands of years down here on the bottom, which is why you don't hear very much about it as a negative emissions, uh, at least as the natural process. But on a geologic timescale, this is actually quite fast. And this is the main buffering mechanism 
uh, initially for taking up excess CO2 when lots of volcanoes go off, uh, for instance. Well, um, you can imagine doing uh, that buffering mechanism in really kind of four different ways at an engineered scale. You can uh, take ambient CO2 or uh, point sources of CO2, flue gases, and you could think about doing a reaction of um, uh, calcium carbonate with excess CO2 either in freshwater or in seawater. And as chemical oceanographers, we make up this term omega, so you don't understand what we're saying. But really all this is, is the saturation state uh, of seawater, uh, at the, the value of where you sit relative to the saturation state. So if you're less than one, you have a tendency to dissolve. And if you're greater than one, you have a tendency to precipitate. And so straight away, seawater has somewhat of an issue that it doesn't naturally want uh, this rea the reaction of calcium carbonate to dissolve. It wants it to precipitate. But if you add flue gas CO2, that's so acidic that seawater goes from being super saturated to being undersaturated and the reaction runs uh, downhill. That isn't, to say, that isn't to say that you should ignore any of these other three uh, uh, spots to do accelerated weathering of limestone or AWL. Um, uh, fresh water is naturally undersaturated. And so just even ambient CO2 will drive uh, a reaction to go forward. And you could imagine some very highly distributed version of this where Amazon drones bring out uh, uh, bags of carbonate to people who have a, a little reactor set up in their backyard. Um, uh, another neat example, I think this would work quite well in Los Angeles, uh, is to couple power plants and wastewater treatment. So this is uh, uh, fresh water, wastewater uh, coming out of urban areas, and urban areas generating their power through burning fossil fuels have the two components we need. They have the acid from the CO2 and the fresh water uh, uh, to do the reaction in, and then we just need to truck limestone to uh, those places. And so, for instance, Here's the end of the runway at LAX here in Los Angeles, much less busy these days. Um, and LAX has its main uh, um, uh, wastewater treatment plant, Hyperion, with a very long uh, pipe heading out a couple miles out to sea right here at the end of the runways. And it also has uh, the, its main 830 megawatt um, power plant, Scattergood, just to the south uh, down over here. Google Maps seems to think that I like beer, and so it showed the El Segundo Brewing Company here as well. Um, so there's LEX, here's Hyperion, here's Scattergood. They're sitting right next to each other, right next to the ocean. And so we, you could, in principle, take the 830 megawatt uh, with 10% CO2 coming out of these uh, uh, um, uh, smokestacks, build a pipe right next door to its neighbor, where you have 275 million gallons per day of uh, wastewater treatment going on and neutralize the main base load power of, of, California, of Los Angeles in, uh, in its wastewater and have it out at sea as bicarbonate ions, um, a very safe uh, way to, to store the carbon. However, LA is really unique to this um, uh, because we gather our water from all around the state. We don't just have our water from the rainfall that falls above us, but we have a massive infrastructure to bring fresh water to the 15 million people that live here, um, this will not really work at scale because if you decided to try to scale this up, you would need something like all the world's river outflow to do the 40 gigatons of CO2 that we emitted uh, last year. That isn't, negative emissions don't have to hit that 40 gigaton target, but it's at least a nice benchmark to sort of think about uh, the scale of the problem. And I don't think we're going to be able to capture every last bit of rain that falls on land to be able to bubble CO2 into it and react it with limestone. And so uh, we're driven back to uh, point sources and uh, seawater, the two largest uh, things around. Um, and that then gets you thinking if you want to do anything like Scattergood and Hyperion or uh, reactions uh, with seawater about what this might cost and what this uh, might look like in principle. And your, and your three main costs come from you're going to need to bring in water, seawater or fresh water. You're going, to, uh, you're going to need to move CO2 around in some sort of blower. And you're going to have to add, uh, uh, you're going to have to buy, crush, and transport limestone uh, to add into this swimming pool reactor with lots of surface area here. It's a very schematic drawing. Um, so you need to blow in CO2, you need to pump water uphill, and you need to uh, buy and crush limestone. We priced that out a couple of years ago of what that would look like, and it comes out at something like $60 a ton, where the chief uh, uh, expenses are in the limestone, and one of the chief expenses of that limestone 
is the transportation cost itself. And if you try to truck your limestone in, you're never really gonna make it uh, price-wise or uh, uh, CO2 neutral-wise. It, it, uh, we did it by train, and if you did it by barge, it really becomes uh, much cheaper. And so these kinds of processes, uh, while not $20 a ton or $5 a ton, a place we'd love to sit, at least in these initial stages, they're not crazy as a way to, to go forward, the accelerator weathering on the system. Okay. We have landed on cargo ships for a couple of basic reasons. And that is, A, they're 3% of global emissions. Um, they have about 5% CO2 in their flue gas. And so we don't need any sort of catalysis or any other way to make the reaction go faster. The CO2 has enough acid that it drives you enough below uh, equilibrium, enough away from the saturation state that the kinetics of the reaction actually go quite fast. And um, such that we think that with you build the right size reactor on a ship, we can keep up with their emissions during the voyage across the Pacific or across the Atlantic. So we're, we're thinking about transoceanic shipping, at least at first. These are the Panamax and larger uh, type cargo ships because they have a vast capacity to carry limestone and seawater is essentially a free resource. They're sliding through the seawater and going at, at um, at 20 knots, they are their own natural water pump just to bring the seawater in. This is something the industry has done for decades. Before they used diesel, they were all steamers um, and they uh, use seawater as the coolant in their steam process. Okay, we have been thinking about this, um, uh, this reaction and uh, at least trying to schematically model it to see if it's even feasible. And so the, if you make a fluidized bed reactor and bubble in all three phases, the solid uh, uh, at different grain sizes, the bubbles at different radiuses, um, and uh, then you uh, are doing this all in the presence of seawater, you can work out the reactor efficiency if you understand the two key mass transports. One being how quickly can gas go from the bubble to being dissolved in solution, and how quickly does a solution of a given acidity that comes from this bubble to solution dissolve the solids is the strong function of the size of the solid uh, that you use. Um, that $60 a ton used uh, 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 grain sizes of about 100 microns, of a few hundred microns, so they sit in here. And our standard bubble um, uh, that, we're, that we're achieving in the lab quite easily by just buying like little fish uh, tank bubblers sits up here. And you can see with a little bit of engineering, we are gonna easily hit 50% efficiency, if not much larger efficiencies with some ways forward that we think we understand. And then the final reason I think concentrating on uh, the shipping industry is kind of nice for a, pro a project like this is that all nets uh, uh, share kind of the same initial problem. Are you going to try and go after a market uh, someplace where you are doing a reaction and, and Cody walked you through this very nicely. Are you going to find a place where you can do something that sequesters carbon and still make you money? Or are you gonna go after it at scale from the very beginning? And if you do, if you try to go after 40 gigatons uh, from the beginning, you know that you're gonna overwhelm any market that you get into as you scale up, just because of the size of the effluent from the fossil fuel energy, uh, from the fossil fuel industry, the largest part of the energy industry and the largest part of GDP in the world. Um, the shipping industry sits in a nice little spot in that it's under pressure to decarbonize already from IMO 2050. They have to be in 50% emissions by, uh, of their 2008 emissions by 2050. The ships last 20 or 30 years, and so they need to be making these ships that are going to uh, do this like right now. And so you have an industry that's under pressure to decarbonize without having to make a product at and is doing 3% of the emissions in the first place. And it's a nice coupling of the scale problem and uh, this, this business problem. And so I think I've seen a couple different ideas and brought your attention to the ocean. So I stopped there so that we could take a bunch of questions uh, as a panel. Thanks very much for listening. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Well, uh, thank you, Jess. We actually have one more panelist uh, still to come.